Welcome back. Today's headlines of CCTV's news bulletin are Chemical Near America's 2023's welcome reception, an interview with US EPA and industry on environmental justice and the Tosca implementation, our local reporter Pierre takes us back to the gold rush time, and to start with Mark Herwig with some sound bites from yesterday's seminar on California and other state perspectives on chemical control legislation. Where this morning we had a number of presentations on uh, the current state of California chemical control regulations, um, which there is a lot happening. And uh, similarly, we talked about some of the other states in the country that are doing uh, similar but non-harmonized activities on chemical control legislations, including Massachusetts, uh, the state of Maine, New York, uh, Minnesota, uh, and a few others. And uh, the, the trend that you uh, see from these conversations and presentations is that uh, more and more states are taking up their own uh, initiatives to um, develop and implement uh, chemical control regulations for their constituencies at the state level. There are a wide variety of reasons for this, uh, but you know, they, are, they are trying to do things that that serve their particular state. Um, it's not unlike, uh, to a certain extent, what happens in the European Union with member states and member state authorities doing their work. Um, we had a fairly robust Q&A session uh, after the presentations, and what, what has come very clear there is uh, that the states and what they're doing, including in combination with what the US federal government is doing is that it is just a patchwork of chemical control regulations that are to a large extent not harmonized. The timing of implementation is not harmonized. The chemical lists are not harmonized. Pretty much everything is not harmonized. So from an industry standpoint, this becomes a particularly difficult challenge uh, to address so that we, uh, of course, can be in compliance and ensure surety of supply and um, business continuity because that's what it is that we do and that's why we're here. Let's connect with our local reporter and learn more about yesterday's welcome reception. Pierre, it was great seeing you last night at the former bank building. Before you tell us more about last night's event, where are you now? Yes, Tiered, I'm at the Wells Fargo Museum, which tells the story of the California gold rush a period of massive migration to California in the mid-19th century after gold was discovered in the area. Now, had the gold rush never happened, San Francisco wouldn't be the city it is today. But still, within a period of one year, San Francisco goes from a sleeping village of 400 people into a bustling city of 50,000, among them some of the most excitable and unsettled people the world has to offer. The story of the gold rush at the Wells Fargo Museum provides a fascinating look into one of the most important events in American history and the role of banking and transportation in supporting the growth and development of the American West. The museum showcases artifacts and exhibits that depict the experiences of the miners and merchants, including gold nuggets and a stagecoach during this exciting period. But remember, not only did San Francisco become a starting point for people that wanted to strike it rich in the gold mines, it also became a starting point for criminals that wanted to run away from their past. Very often, those two were the same thing. You might have heard of Black Bart. Between 1875 and 1883, a polite, even gentlemanly, nonviolent criminal robbed 28 stagecoaches in Northern California. Although armed with a shotgun, he never fires a shot, touches a victim, or takes anything from a passenger. During one of his stagecoach robberies, he's recorded saying to a young, terrified lady who offers her purse, Madam, I'm not here for your money, I'm here for Wells Fargo's. To add to his ruthlessly good manners was a flair for literature. His tendency to leave poems at the scene of his crimes earned Black Bart a legendary status, symbolizing his lawlessness and adventure in the gold rush. Talking about poetry, during yesterday's welcome reception, your delegates got an interactive experience where in a few minutes, they could get a personalized poem. And for every poem written, a tree would be planted. Please watch my expression of yesterday's welcome reception. The Hibernia Bank, a treasure so grand, founded in 1892 in the heart of the land. Built to withstand time with walls so strong and bold, a testament to wealth in the city of gold. The marble columns rise to the ceiling so high, the stained glass shines like a beacon in the sky. A place of beauty, 
where history comes alive, a symbol of prosperity in the city where dreams thrive. In this magnificent place, a welcome reception with old and new friends in a chem connection. The chemical industry, a boon to all, a catalyst for growth with a future so tall. So we celebrated in this grand old place, a symbol of our city with a smiling face, a celebration of friendship in this place so fine, a toast to the future and the love of our time. Wow, that was marvelous. You earned your next fortune cookie. Go everywhere and nowhere. Yes, follow your dream cloud in the sky and go where the wind can roam free and the spirit can fly. Simultaneously, we will watch the highlights of the interview I had with Michal Friedhoff and Kelly Peterson on environmental justice and the Tosca implementation. I mean, I think there's, there's a, a variety of different grant programs that we're standing up. So, for example, in the Chemical Safety Office, we have $100 million over five years that are for pollution prevention grants, and some of them have a specific focus on environmental justice. And really what those grants do is provide technical assistance to businesses to help them reduce pollution at the source, uh, in some cases focused specifically on reducing pollution in disadvantaged communities. In other cases, um, it's related to increasing access to sustainable products in those same communities. There's other grants that the agency is receiving that are that are about community-based air monitoring or uh, you know, ensuring that there's climate resilience and, and adaptation, trying to find ways to reduce sources of indoor pollution. Uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunities. Well, while enormous, there might uh, be some challenges in trying to figure out which program, you know, which criteria, which community, you know, you're operating in, and uh, which grant specifically. Um, we can look to do things like reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and, you know, go to energy service providers for projects to help us uh, become more energy efficient. We can look for, like you said, the, the technical expertise to, to facilitate some of these uh, projects related to, you know, equipment or the output of the equipment. So there are a lot of opportunities. I think it remains to be seen in general, but it will definitely depend on the communities in which we operate and the type of programs and grants available. You can watch the complete interview on our YouTube channel. Let's return to our local reporter. Pierre, in which space are you? I'm at 101 Second Street, one of many POPOs here in San Francisco. POPOs stands for Privately Owned, Publicly Open Space. These spaces were part of a program that was established in 1985 in order to give public access to privately owned areas. Roughly, the building conditions are for every 50 square foot of office space to give one square foot back of POPOs. These popos are scattered throughout the city and they provide an opportunity for the public to enjoy open spaces and greenery in areas that might otherwise be dominated by buildings and concrete. They can range from smaller rooftop gardens like this one to the massive Salesforce Park in which we're standing right now. This is an elevated urban garden which spans four city blocks the length of 4.5 football fields. Now, of the 68 popos in San Francisco, many of them are hidden gems or undiscovered, and which makes for a very interesting feature in San Francisco's urban landscape. Wow, what a great concept. Another feature of San Francisco's urban landscape is the many unhoused. It seems that also after the gold rush, many people find their way towards San Francisco. That's correct. And there are many reasons why there are so many unhoused in San Francisco. Some of the contributing factors include lack of affordable housing, lack of access to mental health services, and also healthcare and high cost of living in the city. Now, in addition, San Francisco's mild climate and liberal policies have also made it a popular destination for unhoused across the country. Solutions should be tailor-made as no two people are alike. And the city has launched various initiatives aimed at addressing the problem, but it remains a significant challenge for the city and its inhabitants. But everyone has their own story. For example, Emperor Norton in the mid 19th century became a beloved and legendary figure in this city because of his eccentric and colorful character. Let's jump to his Empire Park. Another Popo's where Joshua Norton once lived. Now, since for some reason or another, the park is closed today, I'll bring you guys to another Popo's and share with you the story, the rise and fall of this gold rush businessman. In 1849, Joshua Abraham Norton appears in San Francisco and establishes himself as a successful businessman. And this went quite well for a while until he sold his property to invest in a shipment of rice. Long story short, the shipment turned out bad. 
he lost his investment, he had to sell his home, and in shame, Joshua Norton had to leave San Francisco. But two years later, the eccentric Norton reappears in the city dressed a bit differently. He's wearing a full officer's regalia, feathers on his cap, and a saber on his belt. And he declares himself Emperor Norton, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico. Now, San Franciscans, instead of criticizing the man, they embraced him. People on the street started greeting him. Businesses started inviting him in. Restaurants, the theater, and even the U.S. government in the year 1870 establishes Joshua Norton as emperor. So things were going well, and thus started the street career of Emperor Norton. And this kept growing and growing and spiraling upwards. He established his, his own currency at one point. He also got involved in foreign legislation, writing letters to Queen Victoria. And by the year 1880, when his funeral happened, 30,000 San Franciscans lined up outside the city hall to say goodbye to an unhoused man who declared himself Emperor of the United States. What an intriguing story. You deserved another fortune cookie. Apologies for the fact that it's a bit crumbled. Reach your core, shake the ground and move the earth. Time for a statement of the day on groundbreaking approaches for hazardous risk management. Or is everything business as usual? Let's ask Len Sweet of Buick. Len, welcome. Glad to be here at ChemCon 2023 and thank you for having me. Len, are there any new hazard and risk management approaches for industry around the globe? Yes, NAMS, New Approach Methods. These are innovative tools that help inform the chemical risk assessment process. They include in vitro assays, in silico methods, and computational approaches. You can have NAMS for endocrine disruption, NAMS for inhalation toxicology. These are animal sparing or animal free. We're seeing regulatory acceptance globally. US EPA and Canada have accepted NAMS and listed them as approved options for meeting information requirements for new chemical notifications. And EU REACH, under EU REACH, uh, ECHA is using NAMS to uh, identify red flags in industry dossiers or to prioritize further testing. And industry can use NAMS to fulfill EU REACH regulatory requirements. So we have this sea change right now with integrating various data streams, including NAMS and traditional toxicology to help inform uh, chemical risk assessment. And your statement is? NAMS, or new approach methods, are transforming how we do risk assessment globally. Okay, thank you very much for your statement. Uh, let's go to the forecast and see what we have in store today. On Tosca Tuesday, we have a whole morning on the improvisation aspects of Tosca, both existing and new chemicals. In the afternoon, we start with an update on Canada's chemicals management plan, and at the end of the day, we look into PFAS restriction developments around the globe, including the recently launched PFAS restriction proposal in Europe. Thank you for watching, and enjoy your day. Thank you.